God's word with us. And um, let's give him some encouragement as he comes. <laughs> David's been leading the Alpha course for the last eight, nine weeks. So he's, he's not been in church, actually in, uh, in the service as much. But uh, it's great to have him uh, speaking this morning. So I'm going to pray for you, David, and hand over to you. Lord, I just pray that the, the word that you've given David, Lord, um, Lord, we will really resonate with us this morning, Lord. We will sense that you are speaking to us through the words that David brings, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that he will be blessed as he brings them. And, Lord, I pray that we would be challenged and blessed as we receive them. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, types of my talk, are you available? Oh, Aaron, I asked you not to do that. I made him type that. Um, um, as Marcus has mentioned, I've been in Alpha for a few weeks, and so um, have you all missed me? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's been great being in Alpha, and it's been a really nice nine weeks through there, but I'm really pleased and excited to be getting back into church and um, to get to know those of you that I don't know yet. Um, I understand that over the last few weeks you've been doing one or two little sort of introductions to kind of get people you know, to know each other. And so to help with that, I've decided to just draft a little book. Um, Caroline in our church, oh, she must be through, she's got an actual book coming out soon that she's written. I'm not quite at that level, but you might be familiar um, with kids' books that are available, then they are a literary classic that I'm adding to, and they're books that start with, that's not my. So this one is, that's not my angel. And we go through, that's not my angel, her hair is too soft. And they do a whole range of these. So I've decided to launch a title, if you could get this one ready for me, that's not my pasta. <laughs> so the first page, that's not my pasta, his head is too shiny. We can have the next page please, Aaron. That's not my pasta, his face is too hairy. <laughs> next one. That's not my pasta, she wears lipstick. <laughs> That's a new thing for pastors in the Apostolic Church. <laughs> That's my pasta with a beautiful smile. <laughs> um, I hope I haven't offended anybody too much in that. I did pick the worst photo of myself I could find. Um, but we need to be able to laugh at ourselves at church. We need to be able to enjoy ourselves. Other people are laughing at us, we might as well laugh with them. But, you know, we do need to be able to have some fun at church. And um, we're on an adventure with God. One church has formed. We're on an adventure with him. There's going to be some hard work involved. But God wants us to enjoy it and to have fun along the way. And um, I've just got a little article I want to read a bit from. And this was a year or so ago. Jeremy Paxton wrote an article about the Church of England and its potential decline. Um, I don't know an awful lot about Jeremy Paxton, but I don't think he was a Christian from the article. And um, But there were a few bits that he's written, and I've picked out the bits that I liked, a um, bit like when we read the Bible, you just go with the bits you like. Um, that's a joke, by the way. <laughs> and this is the first bit of the article that he wrote. He says, you can hear, almost hear St. Peter's Brighton before you see its towering neo-Gothic stonework. On a stage inside, a band, two guitars, drums, keyboard, vocalists and backing singers is amplified to sub-Glastonbury volume. The lyrics to songs are displayed on flat screen monitors mounted on pillars. There is no sign of an altar and not a dog collar to be seen. The church warden wears a t-shirt. The congregation are mainly in trainers and jeans and there are plenty of tattoos on show. As a little side note, I haven't got a strong view on tattoos, but I am always pleased that Julie and Dorcas cover theirs up for church. <laughs> <laughs> Have you missed me, Julie and Dorcas? Um, Jeremy Paxton continues, its message is welcoming and forgiving, and there is much uplifting of palms and raising of arms in the air. The overwhelming impression is that people are enjoying themselves. Shock horror, <laughs> enjoying ourselves in church. A young woman at the doorway explains how the church has helped her and put her life back together after years of drug addiction. A formerly homeless man smiles a greeting. The vicar, Archie Coates, introduces to the congregation a woman who has been spared a prison sentence on drug charges, almost, it sounds, as a consequence of divine intervention with the judge. Praise the Lord. Jeremy Paxton wrote that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. A little bit of background for you. 
Um, in 2007, St Peter's in Brighton, which is sometimes called Brighton Cathedral because it's a really big building, in 2007 they were this close to making the decision to close the church because they had a handful of people left in that church, um, an ageing congregation that were slowly depleting through natural causes. And um, in 2009, Holy Trinity Brompton took over. I'm a bit, after Alpha, I'm a bit of a Nat- Nicky Gumbel fan again, and it's, so I've been <laughs> doing a bit of reading. But Holy Trinity Brompton, which is Nicky Gumbel's church, took over in 2009. Ten years later, that congregation is a 1,000 people. And it is a wow, yeah. <laughs> One church, we are only ten weeks in, but where are we going to be in ten years' time? Could we be a church of a thousand plus? You know, our vision is to see hundreds come to faith in Jesus and become his disciples. And it's not just about big numbers. It's about hundreds of individuals finding that personal relationship with Christ. Hundreds of individual unique stories about God transforming lives. And, you know, as I've been preparing and just studying this web, my faith is starting to rise (laughs) I'm getting excited about what we can do. You know, there's been for quite a few weeks, I know I haven't been in here, I've been next door. and um, But, you know, there's been a lot of focus on Emerge, on jobs and work and the stuff to do with that. But I just feel this morning, God wants us to now lift our eyes and look at the opportunity. Because he hasn't done all of this just to get us in a bigger room together. There's a real opportunity. Paxton finishes the section of the article that I've just referred to with this. Yet you would have to have a heart of stone not to be moved by the stories of the souls and lives saved in St. Peter's. God's church lives. God's plan of salvation is alive. God is still in the business of saving lives and saving souls. And this morning I want us to consider God's plan and purpose for us. To consider God's plan and purpose for one church. And fundamentally connected to that is his plan and purpose for us. I'm going to use a David Brentism. <laughs> We're connected. <laughs> but, you know, that is the thing. For us, for one church to grow, to go on, to do all that God's done, we need to discover that personal plan for our lives. You see, God has always had a plan, a plan for each one of us and a plan for such a time as this. And the amazing thing that we see throughout scripture, time after time, story after story, character after character, is that God works his plans out through everyday flawed people like us. It seems to just be this inherent part of God's nature that he uses broken people like you and like me. And despite our repeated failures, our apparent lack of worthiness to the cause, our sometimes wavering levels of faith, he calls us. And when we draw close to him, he equips us and uses us for his glory. And he does this once we make ourselves available to him. And, you know, I started with my book, That's Not My Pastor. Marcus, Katie, Greg and I, you know, we're all different. We're all unique. There's only one Marcus Abbott. Thank goodness I hear you shout. But, you know, we're different pastors with different gifts, different talents, different flaws. But God has decided for his glory and for the building of his his kingdom in Dover that we, for this season, are to be together. And so now each one of us as pastors needs to draw close to God, to listen to his voice, to make ourselves available and discover the part that we have to play. And every person in this room has that same challenge and the same opportunity this morning. And the question that I really feel the Lord has just laid on my heart is, will you make yourself available? I believe God wants to challenge us this morning to draw close to him and say, Father, I'm available. What's my part? What can I do, Lord? Send me. We need to draw close to God and find that personal personal inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that moment where God just quickens us to do something. That was quite a long introduction to my sermon. Um, that time we opened up Bibles and looked at a little bit of scripture and I've been reading pretty much all of Ephesians so there's too much to really unpack all of that with you um, but we are going to have a little look Karen if you could get up for me please Ephesians 1 11 
Um, I'm going to read it first of all from the NIV, but then also from the message. So this is Ephesians 1 verse 11. In him, Jesus, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him that works out everything in conformity with the purpose of, sorry, purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And the words that hopefully you've got up there, the message puts it like this. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. Um, just skipping ahead a bit, Ephesians 2 verse 8 as well, please, Aaron. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Every one of us is created for good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. And this morning I want you to understand that within one church, God has a plan for you. He has prepared work for you to do. And it's not a lastminute.com plan, which is most of my plans are lastminute.com. It's not a, oh, well, we'll just have to roll with it plan. And it's not an afterthought plan. It's his perfect plan. If we want to be happy, if we want to be fulfilled, if we want to know peace even in difficulties, we need to discover God's plan. We need to discover the thing that we were created for. There's always been a plan. God is a planner. He chooses to use us to play our part in it. The Old Testament is full of ancient stories of God's provision and rescue. And throughout it, there are so many pointers, hints, shadows, examples of the rescue plan that God always had in place through Jesus. There's another book that I just mentioned. I um, don't know if any of you have read this, Storylines. This is by Andy Croft and Mike Pilavarchi. But it's a really good book that just shows that story of God unfolding over generations, over hundreds of years. God had a plan. The pattern of salvation, God's mercy and love for humanity reoccurs time and time again. I wish I could like spend 20 sermons, but I still couldn't even touch the beautiful complexity of it, of what God does through the Bible. Thousands of years before the birth of Jesus, God was already carefully laying the foundations of a master plan. I'm just going to give you one little taster. Abraham and Isaac. Those of you that are familiar with your Bibles will know that God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son whom he loved. They're the words he uses. And he headed off to the region of Moriah, went up onto a mountain, and Isaac the son carried the wood for the sacrifice. He was carrying the wood for the burnt offering, not knowing that he himself would be the sacrifice. And just before that moment that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son, God said stop and prepared a ram that was caught in a bush. Centuries later, God the Father allowed the wood of a cross to be carried by his son, by his one and only son, up a hill in Jerusalem, and I never knew this till I read that book, but Jerusalem is in the region of Moriah. So 2,000 years before that event, there's this picture, God's provision, God's plan of a sacrifice. 2,000 years later, Jesus carries a cross up a hill. And again, God prepares the sacrifice. But this time, instead of a ram, the lamb of God, Jesus you know, and I believe that God is still in the business of making plans and seeing them worked out in each one of us to his glory. A little bit more recent history, but still history. In the 1920s, because of an economic recession in Wales, quite a few Welsh people travelled to Kent, and some of those settled in Lydon. Um, and as well as bringing their mining experience, they brought with them their faith and their vision for the church. And in fact, the real strength of that faith was the wives, not the men, which probably doesn't surprise you. And 
they connected with a family in Lydon um, called the Tebbits, and they met, first of all, in their bungalow. Um, even then, God had a plan. He was laying the foundations for something. Our church, all of us are here because somebody was willing to open their house and just meet with these small group of believers. And so they met in the, that bungalow. Mr. Tebbit then gave half his land for the building of a church. I wonder, did Mr. Tebbit ever conceive for a moment that three or four generations later, all of us would be sitting in a building like this? But because he made himself available to God, just did his little part, God's plan starts to unfold. And this morning, one church, I want us to hear that it's time for us to build. And I don't mean building a building, but it's time for us to roll up our sleeves and start building one church. The focus can't continue to be about just a merge and the practicalities of coming together, but we need to raise our gaze and look for the opportunity and the call that God is going to place on every one of our lives. Back in the 50s and the 60s, the congregation physically built buildings. Most of us sitting in here have never had to work on this building, although some people have actually built parts of this building, Josh Bridges. But, you know, those men and women of old, that with voluntary labour, sacrifice, hard work, they physically built buildings. We don't have to do that today, but we are called to serve in the building of the kingdom, to sacrifice, to work alongside each other. You know, the great things about building those buildings must have been what a sense of a project and togetherness they must have had. I went really briefly last night and... Um, I'm going off peace now. Now, I popped in last night on a house. I was invited to a little um, sort of topping out ceremony of a house that's just been renovated in St. Margaret's that I did some design work for. But there was a whole team of guys there. Funnily enough, half the team were probably Christians from various walks of life. But, you know, there's a finished thing there, an amazing building that the clients are really happy with. But none of those guys could have done it on their own. One of them's a plumber. One of them's an electrician. One of them's this... But together, they've built something that is amazing. Starts with a plan. I draw a thing, but if I just draw it and no one builds it, it's a waste of time. And I just feel like God is wanting to stir something in us. Let's work together now and build something. Build something of the kingdom in Dover. God has always had his hand on this movement. For generations, he moved people from Wales to Kent. The Apostolic Church had a vision to plant from Lydon to Dover. They later transplanted from Lydon to Whitfield. And now here we are back together again. Our heritage is connected and our future is connected. We're family. And God is saying this morning, will you serve me right here, right now? Will you make yourself available? Because each step along the way was right for a season. And God works in seasons. The whole of his creation works in seasons. How exciting it is us, for us to be part of this new season. You know, seasons come to an end so that the next season can begin. Marcus said this morning about something new. We're in an exciting part of something new. God spoke, we moved in obedience and one church was birthed. And I do not believe for a moment that God will take us through the upheaval, the pain, the work of merging two churches back into one simply for us to just sit and consume. We're called not to consume but to contribute. God has a plan. God has brought about a change for a reason and he's not made a secret of that reason. He's spoken from that very first prophetic word that the reason is growth. He wants to grow his kingdom here in Dover. We're only 10 weeks in, but where are we going to be in 10 years? What's your part? Are you available? You know, as leaders, we're trying our best to hear from God, to be obedient. But for one church to thrive, it's no good sitting in seats and looking at the pastors to make stuff happen. Again, in Ephesians, I won't put it up this time, but Ephesians 4 verse 12 says, The work of us, pastors... 
is to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. We're here to equip the saints, that's everybody here, for the work of ministry. You are the church. There's the ministry that's going to happen. For one church to grow and to see that growth that God has spoken about, every single one of the saints, every believer here this morning needs to be willing to minister in the area that God has planned for you. No one is too young. A lot of scholars believe that most of the disciples were probably teenagers or early 20s. And those young whippersnappers started a whole church. No one is too old. Moses was 80 when God met with him and he went to free the Israelites. If you're retired, great news. You've got even more time available to serve God. More time that God can use. What does God have for you in this new season? You know, we've joked in our leaders' meetings, probably perhaps from this platform as well over the last few weeks, about what a bad time it was to work to church in January after the busyness of Christmas and everything else that's gone on. But, you know, on reflection, and as I prepared this, I'm really glad that we merged in the winter because we're about to enter the spring. We've done all of that work now. I hate the winter, <laughs> but I, the spring brings hope. One church is entering a season of hope. So how do we respond to this challenge? God just wants us to make ourselves available to him, to humble ourselves. When the Lord called out to Samuel, Samuel said, here I am. When Isaiah stood before the Lord and his angels and he basically cried out, woe is me, I'm cried, I'm ruined, I'm a man of unclean lips. The Lord, the angel of the Lord touched his mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And this is what Isaiah said. Here I am. Send me. This morning, God just wants us to hear, hear us say, Here I am. We're all people of unclean lips. None of us are worthy on our own efforts, but through grace, because of Jesus' rescue plan, we are made worthy and we can have the privilege of saying, here I am, send me. It's different to how the world looks and says, the world says, I'm here, look at me, I'm in charge, I've arrived, but it's instead a matter of saying, here I am. There's a humility. It's about being willing to serve as God sees fit. And I don't know where you are this morning. Sometimes when we feel that about serving God, you know, I'm not good enough, Lord. The timing's not right. If I can just get this done, if I can just finish that. But God is, you know, more interested in our availability than our ability. If we can make ourselves available to God, then he can use us. If we can just draw in and hear that call of God, he equips those he calls. In fact, he wants us to just be ourselves. And I feel that this is something that we need to hear as a church as well. I don't know what it's exactly been like in here over the last few weeks. But, you know, we need to just relax and be ourselves. We're family together. Marcus alluded to that around the communion table. We're just sharing together. Let's be ourselves. Let's grow this church together. Another bit of Ephesians 1, I think this might, Aaron might have this one ready, I can't remember. <laughs> and this is Ephesians 1 verse 17. This is from the message, but it says this. I ask, I ask the God of our master Jesus Christ, the God of glory, to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing him personally. Your eyes focused and clear so you can see exactly what it is he is calling you to do. That's what we want, isn't it? To be in that place where we hear clearly from God the thing he is calling us to do. I came across this phrase when I was preparing this talk, and it was this, to bloom where you are planted. In the message again, 1 Corinthians 7.17, don't be wishing you were someplace else or with someone else. Where you are right now is God's place for you. 
live and obey, love and believe right there. Bloom where you're planted. Just make ourselves available, see what God can do. You know, if we watch the news, we can feel sometimes like the church is losing its influence. The rise of secularization, the you know, less and less influence, so like the church is losing its voice. But you know, the church does go through um, seasons as well. And uh, sometimes we can look back and think there was a better time when the church had more control, more power, more influence. But I've got this little question I've got for you. In 1740, how many people do you think attended the Easter Sunday service at St Paul's Cathedral? Anyone want to hazard a guess? 1740, heart of London, St Paul's Cathedral, Easter Day, how many were in the service? No guesses. Six. Six people. During that time in London, there were 10,000 sex workers, 280 different crimes you could be hung for, children as young as five being sent out to work in mines. And in 1738, Bishop Berkeley declared that religion and morality in Britain had collapsed. He said this, to a degree that has never before been known in any Christian country. That was the state of the church. Six people in St Paul's Cathedral on Easter Day. But from that backdrop, people and individuals made themselves available to God. I haven't got time to go into all of this. Wesley, Whitfield, Wilberforce said, here I am. They helped transform the church. They brought about social reform, the abolition of slavery. They changed London, they changed the country, and in fact, they influenced the world. You know, we started Alpha just nine weeks ago, and people in that room had a certain mindset. And um, there's been a salvation in Alpha as well, which I'll share with you in, in the coming weeks when we've got more time. But people start with a certain mindset, a certain belief or disbelief. But after four or five weeks of just making themselves open to God, their minds are renewed, transformed. And I just wonder, where would we be if we just now focus on just opening our minds to God? In a completely different place, where will those Alpha people be? in another eight weeks. Because God has a plan for every one of those as well. Open yourself up, contribute, engage, join a life group, sign up for a volunteers team, sign up for the kids work, coffee shop, soup kitchen, food bank. There's so many areas that you can get involved to contribute, to engage and make yourself available. God has formed one church to reach the lost in this town and this district. But the influence doesn't just come from this platform or a few leaders who are meeting up here once a week. The influence comes from every one of you going out, ministering and doing the thing that God has called you to do. Stepping into the work that God had pre-planned for you. We've merged, we've been obedient, but now it's time to start building one church. We each have a, play, a role to play. Ephesians 4, I said I didn't have time to do the whole book, but it's chapter six, Ephesians 4, 16. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Every one of us needs to do our work to step into this exciting future that God has planned. And I just want to encourage us to really draw close to God and find out what our part is. Um, I've gone over time, haven't I? There's one more thing, Marcus. Excellent. (laughs) I just feel prompted. This is I haven't prepared this, but I just feel prompted to share a little bit of my testimony. That um, I can remember a time in a room through here where Nigel Bainbridge come and spoke a word into my life. And I can remember crying out to God in a room next door in a prayer meeting, just saying, Lord, whatever you want, I will do it. I just want to serve. I would have been more than happy if someone had said to me, go and sweep the car park next Sunday morning. I felt in my heart, and I had done for some time, a call to be a pastor. I'd never, ever spoken that to anybody. It was just between me and God. And one week, 
when I was here with um, my with, well, attending the ark, I had two of our young children with me. We've got four now, but at the time we had two, two toddlers. Mary wasn't very well for church, and I thought, I'm going to go to Lydon Church because my mum was there. She can help me with the kids. It was back when you had to look after your own kids in church. It was terrible. <laughs> so I went out to Lydon. I'd, I'd that, but this was a few weeks after I'd had that moment and it was a real moment of just breaking my heart in front of God and saying, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do. And when I visited Lydon Church, Lydon Church as it happens, there was a prophetic word from the front and God then in that prophetic word spoke to me in the middle of the congregation and said, David, I've heard your cry and I have a plan for you. My first ridiculous thought was, how did God know I'd be in Lydon? <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to encourage you, you know, within a week of that prophetic word, I then had a call from leaders here to call me into the eldership. And now I find myself stood here preaching to you. I was just a, which still am, flawed Little boy started going to Monday Club with Trevor Wade. But God had a plan. And God has a plan for every one of us. And I just want to encourage you, find that plan. Dig into God. Because he has something amazing planned. I'm excited about what one church is going to do. About the influence we could have. Why can't we be a thousand people? Why can't we build a great church here and reach the souls of Dover and beyond? Let's do it. I'm just going to pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, this morning. Lord, I thank you for just guiding me in this preparation. But Lord, I pray you just help us to receive these words this morning. Lord, to just lift our gaze, to see the world as you see it, Lord, to see the opportunity around us, the souls in this town, Lord, that are just waiting to hear the hope of you. And Father, I just pray for every person here, for every believer, Lord, that you will equip the saints for ministry. Lord, that you will reveal to us the part that we have to play so that we can see your kingdom grow in this place. In Jesus' name, amen.